morning we are uh, this morning we're going to be looking at this first chapter of um, of first Thessalon first Thessalonians. Uh, again I encourage you all to read or reread uh, the, the material in the uh, in the um, uh, in the syllabus so that you will have that deeper understanding of the importance of interpreting and how we interpret because we do interpret uh, how we interpret the uh, uh, the word of God. I, I want to begin uh, with talking about Thessalonica itself, the city of Thessalonica. Uh, now, the Thessalonica, you know, is is um, found in Greece, modern day Greece. At the time of Paul, it was called Macedonia. But it is in that uh, cone of, in the harbor, a natural harbor, a very important natural harbor uh, in, in Greece, in Macedonia at the time of um, the writing of this letter. It had been formed as a kingdom way back in the seventh century BC, BCE. So it had been a kingdom for a long, long time. Then in 315, Philip II, Philip II is known because he is the father of Alexander the Great. And also he was the father of Thessalonica, who was the wife of Cassandra and Cassandra the military leader had named the court for her. So you have all this involvement of Philip the Great. Now you remember that after Philip the Great uh, had a vision uh, of conquering the world, he, he thought that uh, the at that time the, the great powers was Persia. This is in the third uh, fourth century BCE. And they were making incursions into what today is Macedonia or Greece. So he had the idea that if he could get to the Hellespont, which is that uh, area which divides Europe and, and uh, uh, Europe and Asia, if he could get to there and conquer that particular spot, he would be able to defeat uh, the Persian army, the Persian navy. That was his plan. But he was assassinated. And we see this happening time and time again in history. Uh, great visionaries are people who are leading a, a, leading a movement can be assassinated. We've seen that happen in our own country. And this happened to Philip. So immediately his son, Alexander, became uh, the emperor, became the leader of Macedonia. And he accepted his father's vision. In one decade, in one decade, Alexander had gone from just starting off in Macedonia, conquering all of Persia, Egypt, and even to the Indian Ocean, Indus River. So Alexander the Great is known for his for his might, for his military strength, for his uh, for his vision, and for carrying out this vision of his father, even going far, far, far beyond what his father uh, had. Um, uh, had thought, thought might be possible. In 168 BCE, the Romans took over uh, the city of Thessalonica, the kingdom of Thessalonica. So you've got 200 years uh, there between those two. So now it is a Roman colony. 
it not only is a Roman colony, it is a Roman senatorial colony. Now that means our province. Uh, that gave it very special status. Thinking about the Romans point, uh, the Roman point of view, again, we're always trying to understand the point of view. Understanding the Romans point of view, this was a very important colony, a very important province because it was a port city. It was a port city. And so ships coming in from Egypt, ships coming in from other parts of the world, Phoenicia, etc. As they came into this port city, you had cross-cultural emphases, cross-cultural contacts. Much of this was found not only in commerce, but also in the cultic uh, aspect of that city. It was known as a center of cults. And some of the uh, goddesses are gods who were uh, who were uh, shown this great cultic recognition and devotion, they were found, for instance, we find Isis, Isis from, uh, from Egypt. We find a Sephiroth also from that area <laughs> and the cult to the Roman king, the emperor. In fact, uh, and also they had uh, the cult of their own Macedonian, uh, their own Macedonian uh, deities. So it was a city of many, many cults and many altars and many ways in which the people were called to be devotees to uh, these gods. It's kind of like uh, when, when um, Paul gets down to Athens, Remember, he says, I see that you have, you have altars to all of these gods. He even got one to the unknown God. Well, let me tell you about it. So this was a part of the Roman world. Uh, the idea of cults, the idea of the presence, the constant presence of cults, and the call to devotion. I mean, you just sit and walk down the street and walk by the cult to Isis, let's say, without maybe getting up bowing or without recognizing this was important. Maybe it wasn't your cult, but nevertheless, you were being seduced constantly. And if they were making sacrifices, uh, and these were sacred sacrifices, if they were making sacrifices, then you would smell the odor. So it was permeating. They were, they were infused with cults. Now, why is that important for us to know and to consider? Particularly, it is because Paul talks about the difference that has happened in the lives of the of the believers in Thessalonica. He thanks God for that. We'll be looking at this uh, in just a moment, but he thanks God for that. He understands that constantly they are being seduced by these gods, these cults that they have left. Now there are two considerations that we need to understand that Paul seemingly understood. One is the constant seduction. If you're going to walk down the street, and who's not going to be walking down the street? If you're going to the market to get your uh, to buy food, if you are busy and you have you're going to work in this section of town, and you pass all of these uh, altars, you are being seduced. So constantly there was this seduction. Secondly, if you were a member of a cult, 
if you were a member of a cult, you had a certain network. Now we do, we talk a lot today about networking and we see this there. If you had, if you had that network of friends, you had a certain status. You had a certain status. When you left that cult, what happens? You no longer have that. Now, remember we've been told many a times that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Kind of the same idea. We are in a context. They were in a context of constant seduction, and then they lost their status, their network, when they accepted Jesus. So you're going to see some words that are going to come up in our study this morning that have that are socio-political words. Now they're spiritual words too, but they have an under lining meaning that we can miss very easily if we do not pay attention. Uh, there were certain words that Paul used, as I was saying. Uh, for instance, he talked about God being our father. Now, even Augustus, Augustus who became the divine Augustus, God, the son of God. And they had an altar there to him. They, they had a recognition of him as God. He believed his, his uh, one of his emphases was that we would, the Roman Empire would become a family. Now, if you have a family, you've got to have some procreative. So you have a father. So the idea of he, anytime you might mention that idea of family and or of father, and it's interesting, we're going to see in this letter that Paul talks about father. God is father. He talks about God like a mother. He talks about our being children of God, all in one family. So these would be considered, these would be considered words that, that would entice sedition. Those words belong to Caesar. Those words belong to the emperor. You are using these and are using the word father, mother, sister, brother, children, of one family, you are using these as you love, well, as you speak of this one called Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. You are speaking of him as Lord, kurios, the word, the word uh, in Greek is kurios. And it was the same word that they were using for Caesar. So you can see how Paul's speech there, Paul's coming into Thessalonica and sharing the gospel and using these words, using these words that had double significance or considered sedition. They're turning the world upside down. Yeah, yeah, they are turning the world upside down just by using these words. Uh, also, the word, uh, even the word parousia, which of course means the end times, the second coming. As they spoke of that, this would be a part of the concept that, that uh, Caesar would bring uh, to the kingdom. So again, this emphasis on the last things or on the second coming the Lord Jesus Christ returning, those were words that could, uh, that certainly had, um, 
had seditious underlinings. And so they were willing, they were open uh, to being punished and being rejected. So the two things you've got the first of all being seduced constantly by the by the uh, cults, the emphases of the cults, and then the loss of prestige and networking of, of the new believers. They needed that sense of family. They needed that sense of belonging and of working together. We will see how that uh, develops in this first uh, first chapter and really throughout the entire book of First Thessalonians. Another thing that's important, now you remember last week, we mentioned that there were three important uh, considerations that we must keep in mind all the time. One is the Old Testament background. Remember, these people did not have the New Testament. They don't have the New Testament. They can't look and see uh, a defined theology. That certainly is not found in these letters. These letters are situational. They're not systematic theology. By this time, the 50s, by this time, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had not been written. I repeat that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had not been repeated, so they did not have the Gospels. They had the stories. They had the teachings that they had heard and had been repeated to them. So you had the Old Testament. That was their, that was their scripture. But if you were a Gentile, you don't know the Old Testament. You don't have any, any understanding of that. Now, there were God fearers. Remember, we talked about those, the God fearers. Those were people who had been attracted to the ethical and moral, and moral teachings of, uh, of the Old Testament, of the Old Testament God, of who he was. So we had that as one of the emphases uh, in in the context, we had the Roman Empire, which of course permeated everything, Roman Empire. And thirdly, we had, uh, we had Hellenism. I don't think I mentioned that um, uh, Alexander the Great, or Alexander as a young boy, had been sent to Athens uh, to study with Aristotle. So he was developed in that understanding of the Greek world and the Greek philosophy. So Hellenization is the Greeking, the Greeking of, uh, of, of the Roman Empire. Someone has said uh, that Rome won the battles, but Greek, uh, Greece continued to be the permeated, permeating language and, and ways of thinking of, uh, uh, of, the Roman, of the Roman Empire. And at the time of the writing of these letters, we know that they were using the Greek language, more common Greek. Uh, they were using the Greek language in writing them. It is a while yet before you have the Latinization of the uh, Roman Empire. So all of that is important for us to understand. One other thing that we must understand is Paul's apocalyptic uh, gospel. Paul believed in apocalypse. Now, what is apocalypse? This is a world view that there is good and evil. They coexist, good and evil. We live, and this is from the Old Testament. This is a part of the apocalyptic view of the Old Testament. This present age, there were two ages. There was this age and the age to come. This age and the age to come. This age, this age is evil. 
This age of that, that we are living in, I'm talking about, is view, is understanding what we see in the Old Testament, in apocalyptic literature, and we find it in the prophets, we find it uh, in different, different parts of the Old Testament, but particularly in the prophets. This age is evil. This age is bad. This age is going to pull us down. But God has a plan. God is going to overcome. God is going to overcome the evil. And the age to come, the age to come is going to be glorious. It is going to be when God is victorious over the evil forces that still exist. Now you've heard Wade preach and others preach and I've mentioned this many a time. You had the already and not yet. That's a tension that we live in, you and I, and they lived in. Who can really explain it? What is the already? God's already won the victory. And it's not yet a reality. Uh, Acts. Remember the importance of 16 and 17 because they talk about the Macedonian call. Remember the Holy Spirit kept telling Paul he could not go back and retrace his steps of visiting the churches in Asia Minor, but rather uh, to go somewhere else. And eventually in the vision that he has,
a moment that goes from uh, from the Adriatic um, Sea all the way to Thrace, which is in the far eastern part of the Mediterranean. 536 miles straight over there. 536 miles. Think about one of our uh, today, uh, some of these uh, uh, shortcuts that you can take, you know, on our toll roads here in, uh, in the States that cut off uh, going through lots, lots of territory. This would have been something like that, 536 miles. So you had a lot of, of commerce as well as the cultic of uh, things happening there. So let's look and, uh, and remember what happened in chapter 16 and 17. And my emphasis last week was on the fact that chapter 16 follows chapter 15. And in 15, if you remember, this is the first, the first uh, church council in which they have said that Gentiles and Jews both are, are welcomed by the gospel and that the Gentiles do not have to be Gentile men who accept Jesus do not have to be circumcised, but they have used the uh, restrictions on um, the dietary restrictions and also the fornication uh, is mentioned as one of the limiting aspects of their lives. So chapter 15 says, yes, take the gospel to the Gentiles. What happens in chapter 16? Paul hears the Macedonian call. Goes to Philippi and you know that wonderful, wonderful story. And it must have been longer than three weeks that he was there because he developed such a loving relationship with the, with the Philippian church. As, as you can see, if you read uh, the letter to the Philippians, they were thrown out of town. Now, there's a little caveat there. They were not thrown out. Remember, Paul, Paul says, we're Roman citizens. And so the magistrates come and they are fearful because they have flogged, they have beaten the uh, Paul and Silas. So they are fearful that they might denounce them. So now they say, please leave our city. Please leave our city. And you remember Paul says, we will, but he goes by and visits the, church, uh, the believers in the house of Lydia. Then they go on to Thessalonica. Now, if you look at your map, you're going to see that that's about 35 miles down the road on the Via uh, Ignatia. So they are on their way toward Rome. That was Paul's vision. He wanted to get to the whole world, but they're on their way. They've gone down the road uh, toward uh, Thessalonica toward this important port city. When they get to Thessalonica, what happens? Uh, the letter, the letter that we're looking at now, and the book and the uh, chapter 17, uh, I think it's the first 11 verses in, in chapter 17, do not seem to, to uh, to come together very well. In other words, it seems that Paul has gone, first of all, to the Jews. Now, Paul has just testified in chapter 15 that he's called to be an apostle to whom? To the Gentiles. So it seems very odd that he would have gone to the Gentile, uh, to, to the synagogue. But in the synagogue, there are these, uh, these God lovers or God fearers, as they were called, 
These were people, as I mentioned in, uh, a minute ago, who were called to, uh, who were attracted to Judaism because of its morality and its ethics. So they were people many times who were more established in the community. They were the ones who had money in reality. And so one of the reasons why the Jews do not want Paul teaching in his in their synagogues is that they want to keep these people. They want them to be God fearers. They're not particularly interested in their becoming proselytes as much as maintaining a part in the, in the assembly. Again, in Thessalonica, we're going to see difficulties. So <clears throat> as a result of that, we're going to see the letter. So finally, let's look at 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 1. And it's a very restricted um, salutation. Very interesting. Uh, lots of times Paul's uh, salutations go on and on and on and on. Last week, we talked about the various uh, parts of a letter. And that's important for us to understand, too. You began always with the name of the writer or and or writers. So you have Paul, Sylvanus, or Silas, and Timothy. To the church uh, of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. So already there, we have seen some of those socio, uh, religio, political words. What are they? Father, Lord, Christ, and church, the assembly. So already you have some words that would uh, any uh, any person trying to protect the emperor or trying to protect the empire would say, uh-oh, this is, this is seditious. There is something here that we, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't approve of. This is terminology we use for the emperor. You can't say those words. You can't say those words. To the Church of the Thessalonians in God, God the Father. Abraham Heschel has said long before we were searching for God, he was searching for us. I love that quote. Long before we were searching for God, he was searching for us. God is always searching for us. He was searching for the for the Thessalonians. He was, he was, he is searching for us here today. So Paul begins with gratitude for the way in which they had responded. Notice he says in verse three, we always give thanks. Not just we give thanks, we always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith. And notice this triad here, we're going to work on it. Your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We always give thanks. What are the memories that others have of you or of me? Are they ones that enhance the gospel? Of someone who said we can control, uh, we cannot control the memories. We, we can control the memories that we give others. We can't control the memories that they give us. We need to be very careful about the memories. Paul says, I remember you with such love. 
I am grateful for you. I always give thanks to God for you. And mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering. We need a good rememberer for the life of the church, for our own development as a follower of Jesus Christ. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith. Now, there are going to be three religious words that we find in much of Paul's teaching. Your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of in the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in Corinthians, at the end of the first Corinthians, now about his hope, love, and faith. But the greatest of these is love. Uh, so we need to recognize that these are three key words that Paul uh, uses in much of his theology. We have faith, we have love, we have hope. Here he gives it, it with a triad of work, labor, and endurance. Look at them again. We thank our uh, we thank our God, remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith. Your work of faith. How can our work of faith develop? How is it a product as we are being transformed? One of the teachings that is important during this in-between times in which we live is what theologians call sanctification. We are becoming more transformed. We are becoming more like our Heavenly Father. We are becoming more, more holy, more devoted to God. It is a work that we are constantly uh, engaging in and must be engaging in. Your labor of love, your labor of love, Again, he's using that understanding of labor or of work, but in the way in which we open our hearts to others, in the way in which we accept people who are different from us, and yet we love them. We love them as we work with them. And then in your endurance, in your endurance of hope, all the time you are being, you are enduring. You are keeping that hope alive, which is probably the most difficult of the three. Because we're in the in-between times and we're not seeing, we're not seeing the evidence of it. Rather than, rather than seeing the blessings of God, we say, Look what's happening in my life. Look how painful it is. My, my family has lost its income. We've lost our status. And yet their endurance of hope. The endurance of hope. You can read all sorts of different commentaries and they're going to have four triads going on. Uh, in this uh, interpretation of, of this letter, it's just been amazing. I can give you this after this. Uh, one, one of the triads, we saw this from here, work, labor, endurance, faith, hope, love, and hope. Is effectiveness, Paul is going to talk about the effectiveness of the gospel. Persistence, he's going to talk about the persistence of the believer in spite of. And he 
he's going to talk about the distinctiveness of their character and who they are. And we will talk about this a little bit more. Paul wants a Paul wants to encourage a believer church to use these words and practice uh, their foundational uh, their uh, practice practice the ways in which their foundational leaders brought the gospel to this. You want to know how to share the gospel? This is the way you can do it. Do it imitate. Do it following. Do it becoming like we were. So let's go on from here. For we know brothers and sisters to love by God. Paul wants them to know all the times that God loves them. You can count how many times he talks about God. For we know, brothers and sisters, the love by God that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you. And here we're going to have another try. It came not by word only, but also it came in power. And in the Holy Spirit and with conviction, actually, that's uh, four. But notice how important that is. The Holy Spirit, uh, our message came. You want to know how to share the gospel. You want to know how to continue to live. The Word. The Word. And the Word encapsulates all of the teaching. It is God's Word for us. Now, this is not the logos that John talks about. This is the word of God. We brought you the message. We brought you the message. We brought it to you not only uh, in, in not only in that word, but we brought it first in power. It was a powerful message. If it had been just a mediocre uh, Message, you think he would have accepted it. If it had just been, if it had just been something that had occurred to me, you think he would have accepted it. But it was powerful. And why was it powerful? It was powerful because it was in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings power. And so Paul affirms that. The Holy Spirit enabled me with power to bring this message to you. And that was why you turned to me. That was why you said, this is what I want. It was powerful. It was powerful. And it was full of conviction. Paul just didn't say, well, you know, maybe if you try to, try to understand who Jesus is, you might have a better life. It was a powerful, a powerful, transforming, full of the spirit uh, preaching. Now that doesn't mean all the things sometimes that we add to the Holy Spirit, that you've got to be speaking in tongues and all of these other things. But the Holy Spirit, remember, had guided them to Macedonia. They had been thrown out of Philippi. Now they were in Thessalonica. And Paul has more experience on what it is to be rejected, what it is to be accepted, of what, it, what his message. Uh, and now he is able, even more powerful, with the Holy Spirit and with conviction to share that message. Uh, the message with them. And with full conviction, just as you know what kind of person we uh, prove to be among you for your sake. Paul says, and he's going to talk about this, Paul seems, seems to have a uh, real problem with uh, the fact that someone might say, oh, you just came over here get some money from us. You just want us to give you a free ride. And you just want this and you just want that. 
Paul said, no. Our lives were congruent with the gospel we were preaching. Our lives were congruent with that. You were able to imitate us. Now, not many of us are willing to go that far, but Paul is able to say that. You were able to imitate the way in which we share the gospel with you. Uh, just as you know what kind of person we, was, we proved to be among you for your sake. That was for your sake. It was not for our sake. In other words, we were not looking for uh, free ride. And then he mentions this word imitator. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. That's not the only place in, in Paul's writings that we will see that. That he is able to say, he, imitate me as I imitate the Lord. You became believers of me. Uh, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And you can see this is totally immersed in the Holy Spirit. When we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you see this baptism here. You see how God is immersing the birth of this church, this new body of Christ. You see how that is happening there uh, with the Holy Spirit participating with that. You receive the word with joy. Message to come with power. And with, Holy, with the Holy Spirit and with conviction. And the reception was in joy, with joy in the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example. So look at this. They go from being a cult follower or perhaps a God fearer to a, a imitator. To one who is an example. Wow. When you think of the possibility that we have in Christ, we can do that. We have that possibility as we become not just an imitator, or a one who has received the message, really a child in Christ. A beginner, but an example. And not only an example there in Thessalonica, Paul sees it in this world, the whole area. Paul says, no, not only are you an example there in Thessalonica, but look, you are, you can, uh, so, so, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia. Now that's going to include Philippi. That's going to include other churches, perhaps house churches that have developed with this, and in Achaia. And Achaia is down where Athens is. They're hearing about you all way down there in Athens, which is kind of the center of the world uh, for them. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place all over the world, your faith in God has become known. So that we did, we have no need to speak about it. Uh, notice those words being that one out. Your faith in God, for the word of God has sounded forth. It is one out. Think of the bells, the church bells. Now, when the church bells are tolled, you hear it. It, it reverberates. It continues. So their faith is becoming, going from this imitator to this one who is now the messenger. Their faith is going out. They are the example. Their faith is going out 
and it's kind of like, look at my hands, it's kind of like this. It keeps foaming and foaming and converting it and converting it. And, and so you see, Paul says, it's important. It's important how you receive the message. It's important how you daily reject the seduction of the cross. It's important how you imitate and how you become and how you develop and how you are transformed. That we don't even have any need to preach. Of course, Paul, I think that's really meaning that. Uh, Paul never is going to stop. He's going to keep on, but he's trying to say, just look, look what happened and what is happening and, and what will continue to happen with that reverberation of your, of your life. For the people in this whole, of the whole region, report what kind of welcome we have among them. Now, according to uh, uh, the 17th chapter of Acts, they did have a good reception. They were welcome, but then we began to have trouble. Uh, the welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols. Yes, all those idols that stood up, that seduce you, all the cults that you have been a part of, all the networks that you have had. How you turn to God. Those of you who have studied with me know that that word turn is an important Hebrew word. It's important in Greek too. When we turn, in this particular in the Old Testament, it's conversion, it's, it's repentance and conversion. Remember, in the Old Testament, it talks about. Turn to God. Return to me, says God. Turn again to me, says God. Repent. Convert. Be free. Uh, it is the idea. So turning is a, is a very, very important word. Theologically, it's important in Hebrew. It's important in Greek. And it should be important to us. Uh, and you've, you've seen it used by many, many preachers, especially in evangelistic, uh, in evangelistic preaching. So you turn to God to serve a living and true God. So you turn to God, you repented, you converted, and now you are serving. The word serving, you be, became a slave to. Talking about slavery. Talking about slavery. It's talking about becoming a, a servant of God. You'll pick up on that word if you just see to serve there. Uh, uh, to serve a living and true God. But that's what it means. And one translator said, uh, it would be better to say, you have become a slave to God. You have become a slave to God. You have turned, you have repented, you have converted, and now you have become a slave to God. And there's one more. There's one more. And you are waiting for the Son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath that is come. And that last verse, that last verse is pure apocalyptic uh, teaching that we talked about a minute ago. And that's the importance of understanding Paul's apocalyptic gospel. What's he saying? The word to wait You've got to try it. You've got a beginning to return. Then you enslave yourself to serve. And then you wait. What does the word wait mean? It means to expect. 
So you're looking for, you're waiting for, and it's not, uh, it's not just, well, I'm waiting for uh, Jesus to come. That's not it. I'm actively waiting for Jesus to come. I'm actively waiting for, I'm actually waiting for his son from heaven. I mean, you got these family uh, emphases. Son, it's God, Holy Spirit, it's Son. And to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Now, Paul hadn't mentioned that before. But now he brings in that theological statement. Jesus has been raised by God from, from the dead. And he is going to rescue us. Now remember about the apocalypse. We've got this this world of this this age, which is evil, and the age to come. Which is good, which is going to be terminated by a an apocalyptic event, which they considered imminent. They considered imminent. Jesus was going to return. But we don't have to worry. Now, when we talk about the wrath of God, uh, I, I have problems with that. I want to talk about the love of God. And I think most people would like to hear about the love of God. But we need to understand that God, what is God's birth plan? And I probably can get one a statement about this. God's wrath is God's righteous response to persistent, implacable human disobedience, where uh, disobedience. So God has, and we believe. Sometimes just reduce it to the Ten Commandments. God has his law. Why did God give the law? It was not to have a checklist to see if you had done this, if you had done that, but to put people on the right path. Now, this is one of our emphases in our study on the Psalms. He wanted people to live in ways they were created. Uh, to live in. He wanted them to be the person who was able to promote his righteousness, his justice, his real sense of justice, what is just, what is right. But we like to do it our way. And so we chose, and the word here is we chose to lock up with persistent and black human disobedience. And so God says, you've got to put things right. There is a responsibility that we have when we are persistently disobeying the call of God. Now, if you are a believer, you don't need to worry. And that's, so, that's such an interesting statement because when we are a believer and we don't have to worry, we know that we can trust, as he says here, uh, and to wait for his son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us, doesn't condemn us. Again, we John to 16 and 17. God said, Son of the world, not to condemn the world. And to wait for the Son from heaven to be raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. So Paul ends on a positive note. I struggled with him ending on the word wrath, the wrath to come. 
but when we understand it in its context and in the apocalyptic uh, teaching that is so evident here, then we are able to thank God for the way in which he continues to transform us and, and to enable us to live positively in this in-between times. Without that, we are, we are truly lost. We are truly lost. There's so much being said and written and uh, talked about in today's world about our lostness. We have lost our way in so many ways. Uh, we've lost our way culturally. We've lost our way uh, relationally. We've lost our way in, in myriad ways. This is good news. It's scary. It's scary because it demands my participation. It demands my continued, uh, continual participation in the transforming that God is producing in my life. And it is it is it is an opportunity. For each of us to become again what God would have us to be. So, in these few 10 verses, what do we see? We see possibility. We see possibility. We see ways of sharing the gospel. We see ways in which the gospel can transform lives and make it possible that we can live ways. That are pleasing to God as we become more and more of what He would have us do. Now, next week we're going to be looking in the second chapter and on into the third chapter. So, we need a longer uh, physical uh, body. And we're going to talk about the missionary work. And this is called memory here. And you're going to see. In that, in that uh, rather long book, it's not so long, it's a very short letter. And incidentally, I hope you did your homework because to, to sit down at one uh, and at one time read the five chapters, uh, that was one of, one of the suggestions that we have when we are looking at a letter to try to understand what the major thing is that we can focus on in that letter. But we'll be going all the way to 313, I think, uh, in our lesson next week. These are called memories of. Now that work is going along uh, in, in Thessalonica. And as I mentioned, you're going to see that, uh, that there are some differences with the Act 17. And uh, as I mentioned last week, remember the letter is written long before Luke writes Acts. The letter is written long before that. So perhaps it reflects better what, um, what, what actually happened. Uh, and we'll, we'll be pointing out some of those details. So thank you again for being here this morning. Uh, are there questions that are acclamation? Yes, Alex. The quote that you gave us uh, that God was seeking, I'm paraphrasing, that God was seeking us long before we were seeking him. Uh, that from? Uh, Abraham Heschel. Heschel, H-E-S-C-H-E-L, -E 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 I think. Not very good on it. <laughs> uh, any other thing? Yes, uh, Regina. Um, I was going to say, and those three things early on work of faith, labor of love, um, and, and steadfastness of hope. Um, when I started this in the previous time, that was so enlightening to me in light of James's book and how I looked at it as you know, a work of faith. If, if you get to make what James does, that, that was a real work of faith, but a work of faith leads to a labor of love, yeah, because I think the idea of works so. 
uh, is misunderstood. Yeah. That for me to say not works, but labors of love yeah. is what we do for others. And I, I just thought it was very defining for me to see those two things. And, and that's important because uh, we can't get tied up on the idea of works versus faith. Uh, uh, and yet Paul sees how they are so aligned uh, one with the other. Yeah. Is there any place in town that sells big maps? I think they've got them all over the church. Uh, I don't know if hey, you can bring I, can, I, can I remember that there's a Marty Smith's class. I remember when we were doing the thing. Mm -hmm. There are maps up there. Uh, yeah. Well, here's the one that I copied. We can make some copies of it because it's Everything you talk about that on that. Okay, well, why don't you uh, make about 20 copies for us? And I don't know if Katie can send out a copy of that. I'm giving to Okay. Or, or Judy. Or, I, I could probably. Yeah. I can get it scanned in and email it to Judy. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Also, thanks, Susan. Doris also had a CD that was for uh, teaching acts, for teaching the book of acts. And on the CD, it has a number of maps. I'll try to look through that. It might be something electronic like too that I can stand in the you send out. Ah, okay. Uh, it's wonderful to have the maps that you can that you can look at and really see um, more clearly. Uh, there's there are wonderful ones in different Bibles, and my study Bibles are just a little too big to, uh, to carry. And so. Uh, even though Bobby is so kind to carry everything for me. Uh, but um, that would be wonderful. And I encourage you, uh, when, when you see something listed on there, I mean, like when it, when it uh, mentioned Thrace, that the Aviate Nation uh, uh, road be a, a nation, uh, in Asia, went all the way to Thrace. I was thinking, where? So look, look at your map. Uh, it's right there. And you'll see it's right over there at Asia Minor. It's right there. It's the hell spot. Uh, that's, that's what he thought. If I can just uh, and the reason the big nation was so important was that if you were moving armies, now remember the, the roads were a part of Pax Romana, Roman beast. If you're removing armies, are you going to move them by these roads, these connecting roads? Like the Via Appia, the Via Ignatia, et cetera. Are you going to move them by sea? So you have to make your decision. Same thing uh, when you're traveling. We're going to see Paul sometimes going to, going to say, nope, I'm going to, I'm going to catch a boat. I'm not going to. Not going to walk, walk that long uh, trek. Uh, but there were these two possibilities. Rome had to have these connections. So either by sea or by these roads, these connecting roads. Pax Romana. Uh, you, you do something that might upset Pax Romana and you're an enemy of the people. So be careful. Thank you for being here, and next week we will continue our study. Hope you can be with us. Thank you. Thanks, Kate.